to Luke chapter 9, verse 62. And you can say amen when you have it. I'm going to take a sip of my water. Um, I think I'm getting somewhere in life when you get to minister and they give you water. So I'm doing something right, y'all. But I did get a little water, though, so I don't know if that means anything. I'm kidding. I brought this. my water. Luke 9, 62, it reads, And Jesus said unto him, No man, not just men man, but human, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. This word that I have for you today, it might be a tough word for you to receive, and you can choose to let it be tough, or you can let it convict you in love. And I said this to the crew this morning, after the whooping we got on Wednesday, this should go down real easy. So I've tried to do that thing before where I reveal like my title, my topic, and where I'm going later. And I actually tried that last Sunday, and then in the 12.30 service, I forgot to tell y'all where I was going. So. I'm not gonna do that this time. I'm just gonna tell you right off the bat where I'm going. The topic for today is, what has your past done for you lately? And you may be seated. So the scripture that we read was 962, but before that, before Jesus gives his answer, three different men approach him and they declare their love and affection for him and they say, I'm going to follow you, but first. I'm going to follow after you, but first. I'm going to dedicate my life to you, but first. And they all had things that they wanted to go back and do first before they gave their life for Jesus and bear a cross. And Jesus says to them, what are you doing? What is so important that is behind that you wanna neglect what is happening right in front of you right now? And as I pondered that, I felt like God was talking to me about my past and how I needed to leave it behind. And there were three things that I felt God speak to me that I needed to do in order to get to that point. But I got stuck at the very beginning. I said, God, what is the past? How do I determine what the past is? Because even between my husband and I, we don't agree. For example, we were having some an argument, but not really an argument, we like to call it heated fellowship. Um, so we were having, engaging in some heated fellowship and, and he said to me, why are you always bringing up old stuff? And I'm like, this just happened this morning, it's still today, it's not old yet, it's still, we're still in it right now. But in his mind, it was the past because he had already made a decision to move on from it. It was, it was dead and gone in his mind, but for me, I was still holding onto the offense that I felt from earlier in the day. So for me, it was not in the past. So I had to ask God, I said, all right, me and my husband, we're not even gonna agree on what the past is. So what do you say? God, what does your word say the past is? And in the same scripture, I felt God pointing out to me, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back. So once you reach forward, you put your hand to that plow, you are no longer allowed to look back. You have made a decision to move forward and everything from that point on is the past. Everything that came first is now void. So with that definition of what the past is, I wanna ask you, what has your past done for you lately? So three things, the three things that I felt God telling me about what I had to do in order to get from one point to the other. First thing, I had to repent from idolizing my past. That's what you need to do. You need to stop idolizing your past. And there were two things, two different ways that I saw and I pointed out that we do that. So one, we idolize our past by saying that God can't outdo another. That other people can do more for us than God can do for us. And the first example that I thought of, Pastor mentioned it, a message that he heard Lee Stone King preach and he prayed for a man, the man got healed and I think he was in like a wheelchair or something and the man could stand, he could walk, he, God had healed him. And at the end of that service, Lee Stone King saw that man rolling out in a wheelchair on crutches or something. And he says to him, whoa, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? God healed you. I saw it with my own eyes, you were healed. Why 
are you going out the same way that you came? And the man said, well, if I'm not disabled, I don't get a disability check. He was idolizing his past as a cripple and had determined in his own spirit that God could not do more for him in his healing than disability insurance could do for him as a disabled person. We have to stop putting limits on God. I'm telling you that the God you serve can do more than unemployment and disability, long-term, short-term, life insurance, whatever it is. You don't need to hold on to what is literally crippling you and keeping you back because you're afraid that God can't do more. The other way that I felt the Spirit telling me that we idolize our past is that not only do we think God can't outdo a government entity or another person, we think God can't outdo himself. Amen. That the thing he did for you last year was as good as it's going to get. The time that he baptized you in Jesus' name, that was all that he could do for you when he delivered you out of whatever sin you were in, that that was as far as you were going to go. What are we doing putting limits on God? Right. Is he not the God of the heavens and the earth? Did he not speak, let there be light, and there was light? Are you really going to allow yourself to believe that God cannot do more? Whatever more is, I don't know what more is for you, but I know what more is for me. And I had to stop telling God that he had done enough, and that was all that he could do. Even Elijah wanted to die because he felt like a failure. He had just had a showdown with 450 false prophets and came out as the one reigning victor and decided that God couldn't do more with him than what he had done and wished death upon himself. We have to make different choices. If you want to leave your past behind and walk into a future where God is calling you out to be free and calling you out to be healed, you have to believe and confess that God can do more in your life than what he has done. Amen. Second thing, and this one was the hardest one for me. You have to heal from the things that nobody apologized for. Right, right. It's so much easier when somebody comes to you and they admit their wrongdoing and they've repented and they've turned from their ways and they're promising you it will never happen again. That is a easier thing to forgive then when somebody hurt you, offended you, abused you, and then they had the nerve to move on with their life. That is a hard thing to do. And sometimes those things are done to you by other people. Sometimes it's your best friend who you confided in, turning around and telling someone else what you trusted them with, that hurts. Sometimes it's your own parents, it's your own children, it can be your own spouse, and it hurts. But you have to learn how to forgive them for the things that they're not going to apologize for. There are people probably in this congregation or watching online right now who are mad at dead people. People who hurt them or abused them and mistreated them. They have since died and gone on. And you're still walking around mad and hurt over something that you're never going to get closure on. You have to be okay saying, God, it's in your hands. You cannot hold on to people and hold them with awe in your heart and unforgiveness because I'm telling you right now, there's a really good chance that closure is not coming. There's a really good chance that apology is not coming, and you have to be okay with it. For me, it wasn't the things that other people did and didn't apologize for. That was not my hangup. I told you guys about my mom. And I, I've forgiven her for, for what she did, for the choices that she made. And two days before my grandmother passed away, I was in an altar pleading with God saying, I'm turning 25 in a couple of weeks, and I refuse to turn 25 carrying this decade-old hurt in my heart. I refuse. And I prayed, and I did not leave the altar until it broke. I let it go. I let it go. And I left healed. I left restored. I, I had released her. And I thought everything was all good. My grandma died, and it, and it hurt, but I was like, but God, I'm glad I did that before. I'm glad, I, I'm glad I had created a place for a mom to exist in my life. But then we moved here. I met Sister Batten. We do a Bible study, and I'm like, she's, so who are you? Tell me about yourself. And I'm talking and acting like I have everything together. And I go, so yeah, that's just me. And she goes, mm, you need to heal. And I'm like, I'm I'm healed. Then I, I just told you I forgave my mom. Did you hear that part? And she's like, you need to heal. 
And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm perfectly fine. And I burst into this full-on ugly cry, and hot tears are just streaming down. And I'm trying to convince her that I'm fine and nothing's wrong. And then I hear Pastor Bratton, if you still feel it, God ain't healed it. <laughs> and full-on denial. And I'm like, but I, but I sing in the worship team, and, and I minister, and I do five-minute exhorts. I, I couldn't do that if I wasn't healed, could I? And then I, I thought about it, and I'm like, God, I forgave her. She was not in her right mind. She had no idea what she was doing. And she's a sinner like me, and I don't blame her, and I don't hold her responsible anymore. So why am I still broken and angry and mad? And that's when I realized the thing that I needed to heal from the thing that nobody apologized to me for was God. I had not forgiven God for giving me a drug-addicted mother. How dare he? Doesn't he know how important a mother is in a young girl's life? Doesn't he know how many times it was going to break my heart to hear other girls talk about their mommy-daughter dates and he did not spare me? What kind of a God would allow such hurt and despair to come upon a, a child that he calls his daughter? It was so much easier to forgive a sinful person because that is her nature. That is what she was born into. But God, how could a perfect God offend me so much? I had not forgiven God, and I felt that he owed me an apology because he made a mistake. He made a mistake by giving her to me. And the worst part was when I looked at Jonah, I realized that my anger ran even deeper. Jonah ran from a command that God had given him. He did not want to minister to wicked people. And when I first read it, I'm like, okay, he ran, but it never said why. He just went the other way. And after the whole ordeal, he does obey. He goes and does what he's supposed to do. The people repent, and God saves them. He spares them. He has mercy on them. And instead of rejoicing in that, Jonah is deciding to pick a fight with God and says, this is exactly what I told you. Isn't this what I said when I was in my own land? And they fill in the blanks when God told him to go do something. He, he felt like, first of all, those people don't deserve the grace and the mercy that you're going to give them. And you're going to give it to them anyway. So why bother? They're undeserving. And that's how I felt. I felt like my mom wasn't deserving of the salvation or at least the freedom from her addiction. She got clean. And I'm telling you, she didn't come back. She's around, but she still does not mother me. And I'm telling you this not because I've been through it and I've healed it. I've come out on the other side. I'm telling you because you can still be used of God while you're going through. Yes. But you have to surrender to the work that he's trying to do. I am not completely healed in this area. And even now talking about it, I can still feel the weight. I can still feel the weight of her absence in my life as a grown woman with children of my own. I can still feel the absence. But I'm telling you today that I have healed in at least one thing. I have let, I have released God. Yes, yes. I'm not going to be like Jonah and tell God he made a mistake. God did not make a mistake when he put her in my life and he brought me in this world through her. He knew what he was doing and he has an ultimate plan. The last thing that we need to do in order to release ourselves from the past, we have to stop resurrecting things that God commanded to die. Jesus tells the parable of the barren fig tree. And for three years, the gardener pruned and tried to grow a barren tree. But for three years, it did nothing profitable. And the vineyard owner said, cut it down. But the gardener says, just give me one more year. And if it still doesn't, then fine, I'll cut it down. Now that's reminiscent and symbolic of God's love for us. And, you know, he's going to give you time to figure it out. But at a certain point, his patience is going to run out with you. We need to heed that warning there is stuff in your life that you know God has commanded you to let go of, you need to let it go. Don't hold on to it. For five and a half years, I dated a boy through high school and college. And for five and a half years, he showed me that he didn't love me. For five and a half years, he told me that I was not worth his time. For five and a half years, he told me that I was not valuable. And he told me that in the first year. 
And every year I said, I'll wait one more year. And five and a half years later, I had wasted so much time. And I knew that boy wasn't right for me. I knew God was pulling me someplace else, but I just kept waiting. Your past is your past. And I'm telling you, it hasn't done anything for you. Let it go. I plead for you today. Let it go. Not promises. God gave you a promise. His word is not going to return to him void. You wait on the Lord and you do what you have to do. I'm talking about those things that you know God told you to turn away from. Those things that he told you to let go. The question is, what has your past done for you lately? It's been 5, 10, 20, 40 years, and you're still holding on to hurt from your childhood, from your first marriage. You're going through your life angry and paralyzed by bitterness. For decades, you've held a grudge against dead people. You're unfit for the kingdom when you're like this because you're trying to go forward, but you keep looking back. There's nothing there for you. You're depressed, riddled with anxiety, battling thoughts of suicide. You can't keep a friend. You don't trust anyone. You have a hard time holding on to a job and the job you have you can't grow in. You can't even win a soul because they don't want the life that you're living. You're miserable. And for what? I am so sorry that your uncle did that to you. I'm so sorry that your daddy lied to you. I'm sorry that your mama wasn't capable of loving you the way that you needed to be loved. I'm sorry that your boyfriend beat you. I'm sorry that your sister betrayed you. I'm sorry your brother cheated you. I'm sorry that your friends turned their back on you. But can I remind you that they did the same thing to our Savior? Can I remind you that he was perfect and without sin and we I assure you, none of us are without sin. And he suffered the same ways that we do. But I remind you on Calvary that on the third day, he got up. Life is going to get you down, but you have to get up. You have to get up. will only keep you down as long as you let it five and a half years and I finally said I've had enough you told me that I don't matter to you and I'm leaving and I left and in a matter of days in a matter of days this man right here was professing his undying love for me and in a matter of months We were both baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, married, and living for God together. I did not believe that God could do more in my life than what I had already experienced. I thought the only person that could love me was my grandmother. I was certain that that was as good as my life was going to get. She was the person who would love me the most. And if I had clung to that lie when she died, my life would have ended with hers. But I thank God that I had been working on releasing the past and I was able to accept God's love in a move for a future. Right now, I'm telling you, you can make 60 seconds ago your past. You do not have to walk out of those doors the same way that you came in. Stand on your feet with me. Lift your hands and your eyes toward heaven. Confess with your mouth that you are done idolizing your past. It is not who you are anymore. Those are not your things anymore. Tell God that you believe that he can do more with you right now than he's done with you so far. Tell God that you are ready to heal. You don't need closure. You don't need answers. You don't need an apology. What you need is Jesus. What you need is a savior. What you need is the blood applied to your life. What you need is to accept God's forgiveness. I'm telling you, if there is vengeance to be had, it is the Lord's. You don't have to seek for people to do right by you. You don't have to go after people for retribution. Vengeance is the Lord's. 
surrender to God's will that you've been holding on to stuff that you don't need. You've been holding on to dead things, dead relationships, dead friendships, dead habits. Just let it die. Let them die. Let it go. Surrender right now your past. Surrender it now.